Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. As I said this morning, uh, great truth always changes those who believe it and who give themselves to it. And this truth that we've been looking at over communion is no different. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's just a fantastic verse to commit to memory. It's a rich verse, a deep verse, as we saw on, uh, on Wednesday evening, one writer, a man, James Philip, uh, says that there is no single verse that packs into it so much basic doctrine uh, for the Christian life uh, and for salvation. Uh, and we've looked at the first phrase, I have been crucified with Christ, and we've looked at the last phrase, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. And now we come to look at the other phrases that are in the middle. Both of those phrases that we've looked at already have reference to the past, to past events that have present realities. And the remaining phrases are about the present. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. The life I now live. I live by faith. And these phrases all flow out of what we've been thinking of. They all flow out of what we reminded ourselves of today at the Lord's table, Christ giving himself for us. And we want to see how these truths change us, how the truths about things that happened in the past impact us and change us in the present. And I've tried to come up with headings, but I couldn't. I couldn't beat Paul. I tried to come up with ones that um, got to the heart of the verse, but actually Paul's headings are the best. Um, there's an oldness that's gone, and there's a newness that's come. And it's a wonderful newness, and the newness that has arrived in us is not fully developed yet, but it's here. And that newness grows and is developed by faith. And that's what we want to see this evening. There's a sense in which you and I have already died. But there's a sense in which we're still alive. We're more alive than we ever were. And you are now more who you were meant to be than you ever were. Here's the wonder of being a Christian. So, our, our three headings this evening. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. I live by faith. First of all, I no longer live. Think of somebody coming looking for Saul of Tarsus. And he's coming looking and he says, Saul, Saul, mate, we found a little group of Christians. There they are. They're, they're in the third house down on the left-hand side there. They're meeting for worship. Let's break in and let's give them a good hiding. And Paul turns to look at them and says, I'm sorry, no, the, the man you're looking for no longer lives. They look at him. What do you mean? Sure, it's you. It's the same Saul of Tarsus that we've known all along. They would say, no, 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 I've been crucified with Christ. The, the old Paul that you're looking for no longer lives. He no longer lives because of the cross, because of what Jesus did there. Not only was the penalty paid for all my sin, Paul says, but the power of sin that blinded me to the reality of Jesus, that filled me with hatred for Jesus' people, that's dead. That's gone. The old Saul is dead. All of his guilt is gone with him. And the powerful grip that sin had on Saul, that's broken. 
and it's true for us as well. Now, you might say, ah, well, Mark, it was a lot easier for Saul in some ways. His particular sinfulness was in persecuting Christians. It's much harder to do that when you are a Christian. But the struggle that we have with sin and sin's power over us, the power of sin doesn't seem to be broken. So, how are we to live in our struggle with sin? Why is it that we still struggle? I think there's at least a couple of reasons for that. One is we don't let the truth impact us the way it should. Paul, in all his letters, is very keen to remind Christians of the wonder of what has happened, because we forget what has happened. And even as we hear the very truth, you know, from Romans 6 and from Galatians, that sin shall not be our master, that um, sin has no power over us, that the power has been broken. From Colossians uh, chapter 2, we read there, we think, well, yeah, is that really the case? You see, Satan plays this game of bluff. He likes to stay a little bit in the background sometimes, and he likes us to believe that we're quite in control of our lives when we're not Christians, and that we made these decisions by our own choice, but we didn't. We were His prisoners, and He had a power over us that we didn't grasp. And now that we're Christians, He plays the opposite game. He wants us to think that, oh, sin is so powerful that we are under its control and we can't escape. We need to, in a sense, stop listening to that. Stop going by what we feel and go by what's in God's Word that tells us that the power of sin is broken and that sin is no longer our master. So, we need to believe. And Satan does the same with guilt. He comes at us and he throws accusations at us. You're not as good a Christian as them. In fact, maybe you're not a Christian because you're not like them, and, and you did this in the past, and you did that in the past, and he heaps guilt on us, and we need to take the truth of God's Word and say, no, 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 the, the person, Satan, that you're making the accusations to, and the person that you used to control, he, she is dead. I no longer live. The I that you know, Satan, doesn't live anymore. The I that you are accusing doesn't live. The I that you used to control doesn't live. So, we need to believe the truth. But there's another reason Paul sets out later in this verse why we wrestle and struggle. He says, the life I live in the body. Although heaven has a different perspective on us, we still have the same address, the body. The body with all its ingrained habits, the body with all its ingrained habits of action and thought and speech and doubt and fear and temperament and worry and pride, the body with all its appetites and aches the body with all its aging and changing and trials, that's our address. That's our address. That's where we live the Christian life. And yes, Satan doesn't have a front door key anymore to the house, but he knows where we live in the body, and he thinks he can wander in and make himself at home and issue instructions and accusations as if he is the right. And we've got, we've got that going on, and we've also got our own habits and our own besetting sins that we're wrestling with and struggling with, and what's the solution? Well, there's, this is where these three things are helpful to us. First of all, we, we say, I no longer live. That's part of the solution. I no longer live. I is the heart of sin. I, me, my, mine, my desires, my reputation, my comfort, uh, my feelings, my appetites. We have a me monster 
that lives inside us, as it were. And Satan latches on to, to, to that and, and tries to pull us down. He goes gunning for our selfishness. And we need to say no to I. I no longer live. In Romans 6, we read, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Well, we can say no. We can say no, I no longer live. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness, for sin shall no longer be your master. Do not offer yourself, he says. Count yourself dead to sin. No to self. No to sin. The eye that used to drive us is to be denied. I no longer live. Paul's going to say later in Galatians that we read it in chapter 5, 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So, in living the Christian life and in fighting sin, we've got to fight, in a sense, self and put the old me to death, continually bringing ourselves under our good Savior's rule instead of our own. We're saying, your will be done. I want to lose my temper. But your will be done, Jesus, not mine. I want to vent my spleen at someone, either in reality or in my imagination. I have to say, I no longer live. Your will be done. It's all very well. This is all theory. This is all theory until you knock over a pint glass of water in your study and it falls upon three piles of books. And you want to hit the thing that's nearest. You want to stamp your foot and you go, Mark, you've just written, I want to lose my temper, but I no longer live. That's what we have to do, though. That's what happened. On Friday, about ten minutes after I'd written that sentence, we have to fight. We have to fight, and it's really hard. Um, even something as inconsequential as that, and you look at all the water everywhere and books wrecked and all the rest of it, but I'm thinking, Christ lives in me. but it's a battle. That's why Paul actually says those who belong to Christ Jesus cru have crucified the flesh. He's talking about nailing something. It's an act of violence to control ourselves, and it's in a sense to do violence to ourselves. I will not. You know, I came across something recently, and it's only just come into my mind now, but, you know, people used to talk about you know, things like anger and, uh, you know, outbursts. You know, oh, it's good to let it all out. Don't keep it in. It's not good for you to keep it in. Things like anger uh, and that sort of, uh, let that sort of outburst out. There are some things it's not good to keep in, um, like to put a lid on grief or something. That's not healthy. Um, the Bible tells us that. But you know, this idea that we should let our anger out and just explode it and, and get it out is health. Actually, what the psychologists have found, not even Christian ones have found, that no, it's not good for us to do that. It's not good for us to do that. Self-control is far more useful. Um, so, this is, I, I no longer live. I want to put my plans first for life, for this day, for this year, for this period of my life, but we need to say, I no longer live. Not my will, but yours be done. When temptation arises, and, and I don't, uh, we need to say, I don't live like that anymore. Augustine, the great African preacher, uh, before he became a Christian, had a mistress. 
and uh, she came calling one day after she heard of his conversion. And she came fluttering her eyelids and speaking um, suggestively. And uh, Augustine, the, the new Christian, turned away from her. And she called after him in her most alluring voice, It is I. And Augustine turned and answered, But it is not I. It is not I. And that's it. I no longer live. So it is with us. There's an old Mark, there's an old you, and there's an old me, one where we set the tone and the agenda, but now the Son of God does. And so there's a saying no to self. That's not me anymore. That I no longer lives. So that's the first part of it. How do we battle the second? Part of it is Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. And oh, if only we only had the first half, we would, we would despair. At least I would. I mean, I've got to keep saying no to me. I've got to do this, and I've got to fight this battle, and I've got to crucify the old self, and I've got to deny myself, and I've got to continually die to self. <sighs> what a burden. But Paul doesn't stop there. He says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. There is a new you that is being made new in your thoughts, in your priorities, in your words, in your emotions, in your actions. It does seem daunting, but Christ lives in us. We, we see this promised in all sorts of places in Scripture. Jesus, in John 14, on that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. John 15, 5. If you remain in me and I in you, what happens? You will bear much fruit. Wow. John 17, 26. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and I myself may be in them. What an incredible truth. And how does He live in us? Well, He does it through His Holy Spirit who is in us. And the Holy Spirit, as we've been saying in the Singler Ferguson uh, talks, is the one who reveals the Father and the Son to us and helps us to experience them as persons of the Trinity. He is the great revealer of the Father and the Son, and He comes and dwells in us and through Him dwelling in us, we know Christ in us and the Father in us too. But what does that mean? It means two things. It means a new power. Christ lives in me. Imagine being set a task. You have to sculpt or paint or compose a masterpiece, and your life depends on it. Imagine the fear, the panic, uh, the sense of weakness and inability. But imagine what sort of artist you would be if the spirit of Michelangelo was in you. Imagine what sort of sculptor you would be if Leonardo da Vinci or Michelangelo or any of the great sculptors dwelt in us. Imagine what sort of composer we would be if Bach or Beethoven, or Mozart, their spirit dwelt in us. I think even someday as musically useless as me, I've been able to do what I couldn't otherwise do. And this living the Christian life is hard, being a Christian husband, wife, father, mother, friend, son, daughter, young person. This putting the the self to death, this crucifying the flesh, it's hard, it's impossible on our own, but we're not on our own. And God has poured out His Spirit into us so that through the Spirit, Christ lives in us to enable us. And it's something amazing. We've talked already about how whenever we become a Christian, we put on Christ. 
and we are clothed in his righteousness. And when God looks at us, he sees us clothed in the righteousness of Christ. But there's a, an opposite side to the coin. What does this verse tell us? Christ puts on us. Christ puts on us. And he indwells us. And so we've got this new power that helps us to love awkward people. It can be done. We have a new power in us that helps us to live with contentment and joy whenever life is falling apart. It can be done. We have a new power that is specifically capable for helping us to have peace in the thick of storms and trials and uncertainty. We have a new power that enables us to be patient with really difficult, frustrating circumstances or people, or patient even with ourselves, or nature, or spilling glasses of water. We have a new power that enables us to return good for evil. We have a new power that enables us to be constant and dependable and to keep our word. You know, we might find some of those easier than others, because that's something that we've practiced, and that's our, maybe our temperament. Or, but there are others that we may find particularly hard. But we have a new power that helps us to do these, a new power that enables us to exercise self-control when we want to snap, when we want to rant, when we want to shout at heaven or tear strips off earth. We have a new power. We read about those in Galatians 5. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The impact of the Spirit, the outcome of the Spirit indwelling are these things. And sometimes in life, we forget to use the resources we have. Isn't that the case? Sometimes um, we forget that we've got something, or we forget to ask somebody we know who has that experience. And sometimes the Christian life, we struggle because we don't ask for the resources. And Jesus says, without Him, we can do nothing. But with Him, we've got a new power. Christ lives in us. What a, a wonderful truth. And if we could grasp that and rely on Him more and look to Him more, would help us to live the Christian life, a new power, and also a new perspective. Christ lives in me. The one who loved me and gave himself for me, you know, if, if he lived with me, and the Lord Jesus Christ was with me everywhere I went, well, that would give me a completely new perspective, wouldn't it? where we go, what we do, what we look at, not just in terms of the obviously sinful things, but even in terms of the priorities we've got. How earnestly I, I give myself to, to His cause, how, how I see people and think of people. It's a new perspective. And that'll help us. That'll help us to live the Christian life. Because we don't simply have Christ walking alongside us. We have Him in us, and we are then to be His hands and His eyes and His lips in this world. You know, it's easy to slip back into living my way, where we maybe lack focus on what we should be doing as Christians or misplace our focus but remembering that Christ dwells in us helps us with that. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me. What a, an encouraging truth this is. Um, and it's encouraging, not just because of the, the perspective it gives us and the power it gives us, but even also what do we want people to see? We want people to see Jesus. 
as we go about, as we speak, as we live, as we are busy trying to crucify the old self and, and, and fight against the self that we used to be, to be the people God wants us to be. We want people to see Jesus and what, what happens when they see us seeking to grow. They see something of Christ living in us. The very thing that they need most to see Jesus, they get to see in us. Hopefully in increasing degrees. Christ lives in me. And then the third thing, I live by faith. I live by faith. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How do we live in the body? How do we live in this world and yet be more impacted by unseen truths? We see everything that's happening around us. We see how we react. We see all the pressures and all the priorities around us, and yet you and I are called to have unseen priorities. We are called to believe unseen truths. How do we do it? We're called to believe unseen truths that I have been crucified with Christ. We are called to believe that Christ lives in me. We are called to believe that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. How can we hold these unseen truths in our hearts and in our minds? But faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith isn't just how we start the Christian life. Faith is how we continue living it. And Paul has been a Christian at this stage for about 20 years, and he says, the life I live in the body, I live by faith. Paul, the great missionary, doesn't say, well, you know, you get to a certain stage where you've built up your spiritual muscles and you can go a bit on your own. No, it's all by faith. In a sense, faith is the connection to the power of the Son of God living in us. Faith, he says, I live by faith in the Son of God. The Son of God is living in me, and I live by looking to Him in faith. And that means that we believe the unseen things. It means we put more weight on the things we can't see than the things we can see. And again, I've tried to think, how do I give some pointers here? How do I give some uh, categories for how this works? And as I tried to do that, I'm going to, do, I'm going to give four, but the thing that's from me is this is just all of the rest of life. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that's really what it boils down to. It's not just that we're going to think a little bit about his word, and we're going to think a little bit about his work, and we're going to think a little bit about his ways, and we're going to think a little bit about his priorities. But actually, it all just keeps coming back to, I trust him. I trust him. And why do I trust him? Because he loves me and he gave himself for me. And because he loves me and gave himself for me, Here's four things. I'm going to believe his work. I'm going to believe his work. Sometimes we really struggle in the Christian life because we've lost sight of the work that the Son of God has done for us. We, we feel swallowed up by the guilt of the past. And we need to remember, no, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. I've been crucified with Christ. And sometimes we forget his work of cutting the, the control line that, runs, that ran between Satan and us as if Satan could control us and, and as if sin, we were just doomed to struggle with particular sins and that was just it. No, he says, sin shall not be our master. And we need to believe the Son's work for us because the Son of God loves me and gave himself for me. The second one is we need to accept his promises. 
believe His work, accept His promises. How do we live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me? Well, as we read the Word of God, the Spirit of the Son speaks to us through the promises that are in here. And it's as if the Son is whispering in our ear, I promise you, I promise you this, I promise you, I tell you this, I guarantee this. I am telling you this is the way it is. Truly, truly, I say to you, this little voice in our ear says, through the words on the page, and we're going to listen to the Son. Okay, it sure doesn't feel like that. It doesn't look like that. But I'm going to believe your promises. I'm going to accept your promises. I'm going to take them and live by them because the Son of God loved me and gave Himself for me, and He will not lie to me, and He will not let me down. So I will accept His promises. And as we thought last Sabbath evening, I will take those promises and I will rub them into the fabric and fiber of my life. When I feel as if, yeah, yeah, yes, you say that, God, but actually you don't understand how hard my life is. And the Son says, I love you and I gave myself for you. Trust my promises. Hear them. Accept His promises. Believe His work. Uh, thirdly, we are to trust His providence. Trust His providence. All sorts of things happen. All sorts of things happen. We don't know what a day holds for us. It could be low-grade, stupid stuff that just goes wrong one thing after the other. It could be stuff that we never imagined. It could come, come to us. It could be one colossal disaster after another, one tragedy on top of another. And we've got to remember in those moments that the Son of God loves us and gave Himself for us, and He will be with us, and He will provide for us all that we need, and we trust Him in His providence. He is orchestrating this because He loves us, and He is going to provide for us. And this is what faith looks like. The life I live in the body at 72 Glenaudy Close on the 27th of June, 2021, with whatever happens on that day or the 28th of June tomorrow, I will live by trusting His providence. He has loved me, and He has given Himself for me. And that becomes the, the ground zero of daily life. That's the starting point. I will trust the outworking of Him who loved me and gave Himself for me. I will trust the, the Word of Him who loved me and gave Himself for me. I will trust Him loving me and giving Himself for me at the cross. And then the fourth area is that we will maintain the priorities, maintain His priorities. Um, this is, ties back to what we saw. If we've got a new perspective on things. We live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me, but by believing that the things that He thought important enough to die for, that we will make our priorities, that we will have a love for the lost, that we will, um, we will trust our Father in heaven to provide for us, because Jesus went to the cross so that we could know the Father. We will have a concern for His church and His people because He loves them. We will maintain His priorities. And in a world where all we can see says to us that Jesus doesn't matter, the church is irrelevant, and the gospel is going to die, we say, no, we'll live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The life I live in the body, in a world that says Christianity is irrelevant, in a world that says the church is going to die, I will live by faith in the Son of God, and I will say the church matters. I will say hell is real. I will say God is there. And I will say to everyone, well, I will want everyone I meet, and I will pray for the people I meet, that they would know that the Son of God has loved them and given himself 
for them, that they would find that to be true for them too. We will maintain His priorities as we seek to live in the body in this world because the Son of God loved us and gave Himself for us. So, how do we live in this world? I no longer live. I keep pushing the old me to the side. It it seeks to get back on the, the, the driving seat again. No. And we say, Christ lives with me. And I believe this by faith, and I live it by faith. And I take these unseen realities, and I live them out in the world in which God has placed me. Amen. Let's stand as we come to God in prayer. Lord God, you have given us this incredible privilege of salvation, and you have given us this privilege of not being in bondage to sin anymore and having a glorious future ahead of us, and you have given us the privilege of the Son of God dwelling in us to free us, to cause us to grow and to flourish, and to bring us safely home. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would help us to whatever aspect of living in the body by faith in the Son of God that we need most help with, help us to do it. Help us to put sin to death, to say no to self and yes to Christ, knowing that He is there to help us to do it by His Spirit And help us to live by faith, to live by faith, so that as we seek to live, believing in unseen realities, that people that we meet will see that there's something about our our vision and our eyesight that is set beyond this world, that they can see in the way we live, that they can see etched on our and our gaze and on our face that we live for unseen things, that we believe these things to be true, there would be an aroma of heaven about us, that there would be a, an image of Christ about us, that the life we live in the body would be marked by a Christ-likeness that points people to Christ, and that we ourselves would grow in Christ-likeness for the Son of God has loved us and given Himself for us, and we want to make much of Him because nobody else has ever done or will ever do that for us to that extent. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.